Hello, my name is Major Brendan Herbeck and I'm with Over the Horizons Online Journal. Today I have the distinct pleasure of interviewing Commander, Air Force Base Command, General Jay Raymond. Sir, thank you for being with us today. Oh, thank you. It's, pro it's a privilege to be here. Yes, sir. So my first question with you, for you is, uh, it's well known that the Chinese shot down one of their satellites back in 2007 and uh, open sources um, have claimed that the Russians have tested an anti-satellite weapon as recently as 2016. Uh, with the military's heavily, heavy reliance on communications and connectivity around the world for all military branches, what impact could an adversary have if they did decide to strike one of our assets? Yeah, well, uh, Brandon, thanks. Um, it is clear that space is a warfighting domain just like air, land, and sea. And, you know, for, for my, almost my entire career, for, uh, well, since Desert Storm, since, you know, the early 90s, uh, Air Force Space Command has really been focused on integrating space into every aspect of joint warfighting. There's, there's absolutely nothing we do today as a joint force that isn't enabled by the integration of, of space. Unfortunately, our adversaries have had a front row seat and have watched uh, us integrate uh, space capabilities to great effect. And to be perfectly clear, they don't like what they see. And so just as China did in 2007, they're developing capabilities to negate our access to space. Um, obviously, as reliant as we are on, on space, uh, if, if we were to lose access to space, it would be a really bad day. It could have pretty significant uh, impacts across the force. So our job is to make sure, my job is to make sure that that never happens. So we're working very hard to make sure that our satellites are defendable, resilient architectures that our, that our operators are trained for that, uh, for that warfare. It should uh, war extend into the space domain. Yes, sir. Uh, the term's been thrown out in the past <coughs> that uh, space has been used as sanctuary and, and things have changed to now we're considering it a warfighting domain. Do other countries out there uh, consider it a warfighting domain or do they consider it a sanctuary, much like we did in the past? We've had the luxury of operating in a sanctuary largely uh, since the end of the Cold War. So, you know, the late 80s when the wall came down, the, the Soviet Union um, uh, capabilities that they had to negate access to space really went away. Um, and so uh, it clearly is a warfighting domain. Clearly our, our potential adversaries view it as a warfighting domain. They're developing capabilities. They're developing doctrine. They're developing procedures to be able to negate our access. So. Uh, although we would love to have it uh, be a peaceful domain, we don't have that luxury anymore, largely because of the, the actions of our potential adversaries. Yes, sir. Uh, our adversaries have observed and reacted to our successful integration of space into the joint warfighting construct, and they are adapting. What, steps, what steps are we taking uh, in Air Force Space Command, uh, as well as planning on taking in the future, to deter, to deter a conflict from uh, going into the space domain? Yeah, so it's important that we deter. And although space is a warfighting domain, all the actions that we're taking are largely meant to deter uh, potential adversary action. We don't want this fight to happen. We don't want a fight to extend into the space domain. And I use those words very clearly, extend into the space domain. Lots of people talk about a space war. This isn't about a war in space. This is about a war that's going on on the ground that either begins or extends into the space domain. And so uh, it, is, it is vitally important that in the context of the larger fight that we work to deter that escalation in, into the domain. One of the ways, the primary ways to deter an adversary, a potential adversary action is to be ready for that fight and to be able to fight and win if deterrence were to fail. And that's exactly what Air Force Space Command is doing. And we're doing so across uh, a full spectrum of, of activities. And, it, and they, they focus on the traditional deterrence uh, calculus, if you will, of denying benefits and imposing costs. So we're building uh, increased resilience in our, in our space architectures. We're developing uh, operators that are, that are trained more fully to operate in a contested domain. We're developing partnerships with our allies um, very, very, uh, which is a very important piece of this as well. We're also developing partnerships with commercial industry. We're developing partnerships with the intelligence community, specifically the National Reconnaissance Office. So if you come into Air Force Space Command today, you will see a command at a strategic tip, uh, tipping point. And that point is we no longer have the luxury of operating in benign domain. We are all about uh, making sure that we can protect and defend those capabilities and fight in a war that extends into space to make sure that we can deter um, adv potential adversary action. Sir, earlier you, you talked about our heavily reliance on commercial uh, capabilities, and mm -hmm. yesterday was a successful launch of the Falcon Heavy. What does that mean for the United States military uh, for the future? Yeah, it's, it's hugely significant. We work very closely with uh, a bunch of 
commercial companies across the full spectrum of operations. Most notably, as you talked about, is our reliance on commercial launch. We don't buy and build government rockets anymore. We buy commercial launch services. Uh, we do so through ULA, uh, obviously today through SpaceX and others that are, that are emerging. You know, one of the things, that was a really cool launch. And to watch that launch and then see two of the three boosters come back and land on land, that talks about the innovative spirit of commercial industry. We're capitalizing on that spirit. Although that's very visible. And what you see are, are, is the rocket taking off and, and, and two motors coming back to land, as spectacular as that is. The thing that you don't see, uh, and it might not be as visible, is that launch is all autonomous. So traditional launches, when we launch a rocket off of either Vandenberg or the Cape, you, every launch has to have the ability to be destroyed if it were to start to go past what we call an impact limit line, the line where we could not then protect public safety. Traditionally, for, tr for other launches besides SpaceX, we have a, a range of instrumentation that goes up uh, for California, goes up, for Vandenberg, goes up and down the coast of California, or Florida, around Florida and out into the ocean to be able to uh, have telemetry, radar, and then have the ability to send a signal to a rocket to blow it up. That takes a significant amount of people to man those, all that instrumentation. Uh, and uh, again, two people on console watching if a rocket were to go past this line, they'd hit a button and send a signal and blow it up. Well, SpaceX can do that. SpaceX rocket is all autonomous. It can do that by itself. So over the last year, we have worked to certify their self-destruct, autonomous self-destruct package. It's certified. And now when their rocket launches, it can sense itself whether it, it um, is going past uh, or not flying down the nominal path, and it'll blow itself up. That saves a huge amount of instrumentation reduces the personnel cost for a launch and they have slashed uh, their range costs significantly. C based on that we're going to leverage that work and we're going to I'm going to mandate here in the next five years that all there are all of our ranges will be all autonomous. Uh, significant transformation in how we do launch which is going to really be uh, the foundation for what we need to do to be able to be responsive and, and launch responsibly in space. The other thing that we're obviously heav heavily reliant on is, is commercial SATCOM. Today, the vast majority of SATCOM that we use to su support events around the world are, are procured commercially. Um, as, this, as technology matures and, it, and, and gets smaller, and as launch costs go down, the barriers to entry to space are, are being lowered even more than they are today. And so you're going to see a, a pretty significant increase in those missions that are commercially viable. And I will tell you that pretty much the full, sp full spectrum of missions, everything from maybe potentially uh, on-orbit servicing the satellites or to refuel satellites, to COM, to, to, um, uh, uh, to weather, the, the whole gamut could, may be commercially available in the future, and we need to leverage that. Yes, sir. I'm curious as to how you think the military and defense industry needs to build a technology gap between us and our adversaries so that we do remain a dominant country in space. Yeah, so first let me say right off the bat, we have a technology gap. We're the best in the world. There's, there's, there's no doubt about it. We are privileged, our nation is privileged, and we rely on the world's best space capabilities. Um, and, and there's no close second. That being said, we need to keep running because our potential adversaries, our competitors are, are moving fast and catching up. So there's several things that we're, that we're doing. First of all, we need to prioritize lethality over just operational availability. In the, today, or in the past, the way we've measured success is just the operational availability of a satellite. Is it on orbit and is there any gaps in coverage? That's not good enough in a threatened or contested environment. You have to be able to worry about survivability. So we're going to prioritize that. Um, we're looking at, again, building uh, significant uh, resilience into, into our uh, architectures, which will drive new constellations of satellites. We're going to uh, scrub our requirements, to tailor our requirements. We're going to develop innovative acquisition processes to enable industry to go fast and faster than they're going today. We also need to test and be able to fail and, and, uh, and then learn from that failure and, and, and keep moving out. So there's a whole host of things going on uh, to, get, to get more responsive, to unleash industry. Our industry knows how to do this. Again, we're the leaders in the world in this. We just need to unleash them um, and provide uh, the, the stable budgets and resources to be able to make it happen. 
So earlier you said we are well above our adversaries as far as the technological gap goes. Can you give us some specific examples where we are technologically superior to our adversaries? Uh, across the board. I mean, if you just look at our GPS constellation, it's the world standard, and everybody in the world relies on it. There's other GPS or precision navigation and timing uh, capabilities being developed, but uh, without a doubt, our global positioning system is the world standard, and I'd use that one as the, probably the most well-known example that I could give. Yes, sir. Uh, in the recently released National Defense Strategy from Secretary Mattis, one of his top priorities is force readiness. How are U.S. Space Forces changing their readiness postures in an increasingly congested and contested domain? Yeah, so it is a critical priority for Air Force Space Command. We are working hard to enhance and increase our readiness. The first thing that we have to do is we have to uh, figure out how best to measure our readiness in space. And so traditionally what we have done, we've measured our readiness against a benign domain. There was no threat. And so all you had to really worry about was getting a satellite onto orbit, make sure it survived what we call infant mortality the first month or so uh, while it was on orbit. And then once you did that, you were good. Uh, our crews were trained at a level to be operating, to operate in a, those satellites in a benign domain. Uh, that's not the case today. Just like in the air domain where we measure uh, readiness on a full spectrum of everything that that, that crew has to do, um, we need to do the same thing in space. It's no longer good enough just to measure our readiness against the, the domain that we had the privilege and luxury of operating in for the last, last 20 years. So we're, we're working that hard. The other big piece I'd highlight is what we're doing with our airmen and making sure that they are trained uh, and provided the advanced training uh, that, they are needed, that they need to operate in this environment. Uh, we have recently over the last year, a couple years, and, and this year matured what we call the Space Mission Force. And that's a construct that enables our, our space operators to basically spend about four months working console operating the satellites and then to take a four month period off where they're not operating on shift, if you will, and they're doing advanced training, participating in, in exercises, participating in war games. And in fact, uh, over the last year or so, we've we've stood up the first space flag games to, to enable our operators, just analogous to what we do at Red Flag, but in the space domain to develop the depth and breadth that they need uh, to be able to successfully operate in that domain. So those are two things. One, how we measure it, and two, how we train our operators, which is a critical component of readiness. So you talked about space flag and, and some of these major exercises that space is playing in. Uh, what type of events are we seeing in those exercises that, that challenge our airmen for advanced training? Yeah, so there's a couple couple components to ad the advanced training piece. First of all, as we integrate into weapons school uh, weapons school of curriculum, as we integrate into red flags, we are focusing on increasing the integration of space into the fight. We we've got a master or a PhD in that. My whole career, you know, basically almost my entire career from Desert Storm on has been focused on integration. We keep refining that, making sure that we have the tactics to be able to do that. That's not, by itself though, is not good enough because you have to make sure that you can protect and defend the capabilities that are on orbit today. So if you look at the full spectrum of threats, everything from reversible jamming of GPS and communication satellites, for example, all the way up to what you mentioned and what China demonstrated in 2007 when they, could, when they destroyed one of their uh, uh, defunct weather satellites. That full spectrum of threats is what we're focusing on in, in space flag, making sure that our crews can, can operate in, that, in this domain with those threats to make sure that they can continue to provide the joint warfighters and our nation uh, those capabilities that they need. It is very clear today that space fuels both our American way of war and our American way of life, and our job has come to work every day to make sure that, that, that uh, those space capabilities are always available. So, sir, last question I have for you. Yeah. Congressman Rogers from Alabama uh, is leading a push for the creation of a separate Space Force. Right. I'm interested to hear your perspective as to why it should remain the way it is underneath the United States Air Force right now. Sure. First of all, let me state right up front, I'm really appreciative of Congress. The leadership Congress has shown in the national debate that's going on as to the future organization of space. Uh, I think it's a really important dialogue for our nation to have. This is critically important. Uh, it's critically important to our, to our nation that we get this right. Space, as our national security strategy just, that was just released, uh, reflects as a, as a vital national interest for our country. The Air Force has been involved in space, not just involved in space, but the leaders of space for over 60 years. We, it, 
we have had uh, the leadership role, even prior to uh, Bernard Schriever, General Bernard Schriever, who is kind of considered the father father of space. But uh, General Schriever, uh, with his uh, leadership back in the 50s, really began in earnest the military space program that was tied around uh, the development of the ICBM, and really the whole focus against then the Soviet Union and the Cold War. Uh, we have been leaders in this. Um, over the last 20 years since, since or, uh, since ni the early 90s, since Desert Storm, we have been the leaders in integrating space capabilities into the fight. To the point, as I said earlier in this interview, that there is absolutely nothing that we do today, nothing, that isn't enabled by space capabilities. I mean, just look at a, look at a mission, uh, take any mission out of, out of the CENTCOM AOR. You have a pilot that's walking to his F-16. His weather briefing that he got before he took off was all provided uh, from space capabilities. The intelligence to, of the target that he's going to go out and strike is largely developed by space capabilities or remotely piloted vehicles that were operated uh, through, through SATCOM. He takes off, he navigates to the target uh, via space capabilities. The airmen that are controlling that aircraft provide him that control via, largely in some areas, via SATCOM. The weapon strikes with absolute precision. In fact, the vast majority of weapons that we're dropping today are all GPS-guided weapons in, in that AOR. Um, the battle damage assessment is done via space. So we know how to do that. We, we have been the leaders in that. We're now taking the next step. And, and as, I, as we've talked about, as our competitors or potential adversaries have watched us, they know that, that uh, we're reliant on those capabilities and they're developing those capabilities to keep us from accessing space. We know how to do this too. This is the high ground. This is what Air Force does, and I'm convinced uh, that integration, as our chief and our secretary have said, is, is the critical step forward. And anything that you do to, to, uh, to not integrate but to separate is the wrong, is the wrong uh, vector. We'll see what it's like 10 years from now. I'm not saying that we'll never be a time for a, a Space Force, but today, uh, with the progress that we're making and the speed of which we're moving out, I think space is best handled integrated in the United States Air Force with the operators and the experts that know how to do this business and know how to do it very well. Yes, sir. Well, General, thank you for coming uh, and visiting with us today, answering some tough questions. We know your time's precious and we appreciate uh, everything you've done for us. No, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for, thanks for having me here. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks. thanks sir.